Great. Welcome, everybody. My name is Agnes. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, just a few reminders and some Zoom housekeeping bits. If you could please keep yourselves muted throughout the session, that would be great. You're more than welcome to keep your cameras on, but just bear in mind uh, that this session is being recorded. Um, the recording will be available um, hopefully in a few days' time on the Sun YouTube channel uh, and also on our website. Once it is available, you will receive an email um, via Eventbrite with the link. Um, so you can rewatch the session. Also, feel free to share it with any of your colleagues um, who, who might um, benefit from it. Just a few words about SUN um, before we start. So the Southern Universities Network is the partnership of six universities in the South. We're part of the Uniconnect programme. Uh, and our main aim is to reduce um, the gap in higher education participation between the most and the least represented group. And these expert speaker sessions are part of our teacher CPD um, program. Um, so I'm going to hand over in a moment um, and then please ask questions at any point throughout the sessions in the chat. We are going to have um, a 10 minute question and answer session at the end. So I am going to then relay those, um, those questions to our, to our speakers. Um, and then we are aiming to finish um, at five o'clock. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Bain, Julie and Lisa. Thank you. Hello. It's uh, uh, wonderful that you can join us this afternoon. Um, I, I would like us to begin just by introducing ourselves uh, very briefly. So I'm, I'm Wayne Vec, and I, I started my career as a um, teacher of refugee boys from Afghanistan. And uh, I now teach at the University of Winchester, where my main interest is uh, refugee education. Over to you, Luda. Yes, I am a, um, a fellow uh, visiting uh, uh, fellow research. Uh, so sorry, visiting fellow research of the University of Winchester, and um, uh, I work at the National University of uh, Life and Environmental Sciences of Ukraine. I candidate of psychological sciences, have PhD in psychology. Hello, and I'm Julie. It's lovely to be here. And I also work at the University of Winchester. Prior to that, I worked um, as a local authority officer in Southampton. Um, I've just coming to the end of my uh, research around that Wayne has supervised around welcoming classrooms and the inclusive teacher. Oh, four children that are seeking sanctuary. Sorry, I should have said. OK, well, I'd, I'd like to begin our talk on supporting and educating refugee and migrant students within inclusive and welcoming schools by talking a little bit about the difference teachers can make. And I want to begin with a story. Uh, it's a story that occurred one um, spring evening um, about three years ago and it's a story that since went viral and it's about a, a young man named uh, Gassima who was taking a stroll through a northern uh, um, some suburbs in northern Paris when he noticed clinging precariously from a fourth floor balcony a young child and in an extraordinary act Gassima scaled from one um, balcony to the next until he reached the young child and pulled him to safety and that act of uh, bravery uh, saw uh, Gassima um, uh, 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 awarded um, a Medal of Honor by um, uh, President Macron in France, and also he was given uh, citizenship. And it, it, it seems to me possible that to both um, 
acknowledge and to be in awe of the extraordinary athleticism and heroic deed displayed by Gessima, and at the same time to be rather troubled that by, by the fact that Gassima was only able to move from being uh, um, uh, an illegal uh, 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 economic migrant in France to a citizen through such an extraordinary act. And indeed, this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, distinction between the uh, uh, worthy refugee, worthy refugee, and the unworthy migrant or, or economic migrant um, can um, perpetuate discourses around refugee education. And it leads, in, in, in the words of uh, Sigmund Bauman, who himself was forced into exile twice in his life, to the pressure uh, on uh, people forced to flee from their homes to assimilate, to be like anyone else. And one way that this uh, pressure uh, can, can materialize in education is uh, outlined in this rather marvelous book by uh, Nayeri called The Ungrateful Refugee, in which she, she says uh, every day of her new life, the refugee is asked to dis, uh, di, um, distinguish herself from the opportunist, the economic migrant. And she details the way that for her, this meant um, applying extraordinary efforts to her studies to um, carve out an identity as a studious, utterly committed uh, young person in order, in her words, she didn't lose everything, her entire identity as a smart, uh, capable girl. And when young people forced from their homes feel this kind of pressure, this pressure to carve out a sense of being worthy within their schools. There's a, a terrible loss, it seems to me, the loss of um, um, an education that is, is its own reward, that is its own goal. And um, uh, Raina Grandi uh, also um, forced to flee uh, um, uh, uh, with her family from um, Mexico to, to America, talks about how the experience of, of um, migration was traumatic, but equally traumatic was her experience in uh, US schools, which saw her placed um, on a corner table and ignored. And she details how she was left alone and left voiceless. Uh, on the outside, looking in, marginalized, excluded, othered. And these experiences, the experiences of Nieri and Grande, tell us nothing about uh, the, the actual identity of these young people and everything about the way that uh, prejudice and uh, exclusionary pressures can operate within uh, schools and in society more generally. And in the face of such uh, stories of exclusion and marginalization, it's heartening to uh, reflect on the words of Maxine Green, who was a, a professor of uh, education in, in America. And Maxine Green says, it's possible if we look carefully enough to witness many, many teachers who are willing to choose themselves as healers. And it seems to me that she's absolutely right. And it seems to me that for teachers who choose themselves as healers, there is of course the kind of outreach work with agencies and experts in the disciplines of trauma and language acquisition. But there's also um, the healing work of teachers who are able to recognize the unfolding identities of young people forced from their homes. 
for what they are, for their distinctiveness, for their uniqueness. And in, in this capacity of teachers to form relationships with children, where the children feel recognized, not for what they've been through, but for who they are becoming, there is, it seems to me, um, a way of countering what uh, Hemon, a, a, a Bosnian American refugee, describes as the bigotry that can be directed at uh, migrants and refugees, uh, a bigotry that is contingent upon their dehumanization and de individualization, that sees them presented as a mass of nothings and nobodies. And it's, it's precisely, it seems to me, the healing work of teachers to see the originality of uh, young people, to uh, precisely uh, allow themselves uh, a space within the school where they can become a somebody, not a, not a nobody. And, and much of this, uh, this, the significance of this work is articulated by Ron Baker, who, um, came to England um, as part of the kinder uh, transport movement. Uh, he came as a Jewish refugee child um, fleeing, fleeing from the Nazis. And he talks about how as a child coming from one culture to uh, another culture, from Germany to England, he, his whole sense of identity was disturbed and rearranged. And he articulates beautifully the need of the child for acceptance, for love, and for security. And it's our experience as, as, a, as a group working with teachers, especially teachers who work with refugee uh, children, is, is, is that these are precisely the qualities that uh, teachers bring into uh, the, the ordinary uh, lives of, of their classrooms. And, um, it's those qualities that ensure that uh, ch no child feels a need to prove themselves worthy because their worthiness is uh, presupposed from, from, from the start. So I, I think I'll pause there and, and pass on to Luda. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, everyone, again, and uh, as I've said, I am a visiting research fellow of the University of Winchester, and I work at the National University of Life and Environmental Sciences of Ukraine. Uh, I'm engaged in the development of the modern psychology of creativity and uh, problem-solving tasks uh, in difficult conditions. And uh, I'm one of the millions of people displaced due to the war in Ukraine. So I am a refugee and uh, I have been living in England with my son for 10 months. On February the 24th, uh, uh, okay, so, so sorry, and some words I'd like to say on the second slide, you can see the photos of my university. It is a state uh, university of Ukraine, and uh, this year the university will celebrate its 125th anniversary. And then, <clears throat> um, uh, on the third slide, are, there is a real photo of people at the uh, railway station um, in Ukraine. On the February the 24th, 2022nd, Russia launched a full-scale war against Ukraine. I woke up because I heard the sound of the rockets. The brutal violation of Ukrainian territorial integrity was quickly condemned by the United Nations General Assembly. But the war continues. Death and destruction have reached a scale not seen in Europe since the Second World War. And the impact of the war is felt everywhere. The ongoing war has already claimed uh, many lives, 
and destroyed millions of families and homes. I am at a loss for words to describe the pain caused by the war. About 7.9 million people left Ukraine. More than 100,000 people have become guests of British families under the Homes for Ukraine scheme. Ukrainian refugees who come to the UK under the scheme receive a visa, giving them to the right to remain for an initial period of three years. We have right to work, uh, receive public funds such as universal credit and access public services such as schools and health care. We are here under the Homes for Ukraine scheme too, and I had never thought I would be a refugee. We lived in a beautiful country and in, in a fantastic city, the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv. My son and I were fleeing the war in Ukraine. All of our relatives are still in Ukraine. And it's very difficult to be separated from them. Um, as a famous sociologist and philosopher, Zygmunt Bauman said, people escaped from war and knocked on the doors of others seeking help. For the people behind these doors, those unknown people have always been seen as strangers. Foreigners cause fears in the societies. They travel um, to because they are alien unpredictable and completely different from the people we meet every day. We know the people uh, we know and know their cultural formula and also we fear the fact that strangers could change our life habits. When strangers are among us, new situations and problems appear and we as a society are not ready for them and some societies may be reaching a point of refugee tragedy fatigue. In my report, I don't pretend to give a hundred percent objective analysis. I would like to tell um, only to show my view and tell about my experience working as a learning support assistant for Ukrainian children at Twyford, St. Mary's Church of England Primary School, and a teacher of English as a second language for uh, the children and their moms from both Twyford St. Mary's School and Twyford School. It is called by me Twyford Ukrainian Family School. <laughs> what I actually wanted to point out is the great role played by the Twyford community. This community has organized this support for Ukrainian children and their moms. The community had teacher, teaching staff, learning support staff, and administrative staff of both schools have become involved in supporting and developing inclusion uh, in their schools. They are a key link in providing support for the whole inclusive process. Uh, UNESCO International Bureau of Education defines the, defines an inclusive curriculum as one that takes into consideration and caters to the diverse needs, um, previous experience, interests, and personal characteristics of all learners. It attempts to ensure that all students are part of the shared learning experiences of the classroom and that equal opportunities are provided regardless of learner differences. Inclusion is a process that helps overcome barriers limiting the presence, participation, and achievement of learners. 
As I've said, I'm working at twice at St. Mary's School and uh, Sophie Davis is the head teacher of this school and she implements inclusive education with her staff, community, and parents in their school. Uh, successful and meaningful inclusion of displaced learning is uh, quality education programs is not only about enable them to learn, it, it is also requires action to address their social and emotional needs alongside their academic support needs. There are three main points outlined in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Report on Refugee Education Integration Models. They are emotional needs, learning needs, and uh, social needs. In my school, um, all staff uh, provide all these needs, emotional needs, learning needs, and social needs. I try, uh, I'm providing language support needs language support as well as social and emotional support for uh, the Ukrainian children. All teachers create uh, an atmosphere where all children learn and uh, they build the sense of competence, uh, they form friendship and um, they develop the sense of belonging. I'm working um, with uh, all teachers of this school. Uh, <clears throat> but mostly I uh, work with the teacher, uh, she is uh, Tracy Aitken. Um, for my life, I've been visited a lot of lessons and I've met a lot of teachers, but uh, Tracy Aitken is the best teacher and is the most experienced teacher I have ever met. Uh, the teacher has modified her, uh, her lessons, uh, content, uh, instruction, and uh, learning environment, and uh, time frame. Um, these modifications are additional time, ignoring specific types of mistakes, um, and um, such a learning environment as separate room, enlarged test uh, pages, and um, uh, use of dictionaries, laptops, and iPads. Um, the child gets a certain number of tasks and exercises according to his competences and abilities. Um, and the teacher um, modifies her instructions uh, uh, by talking more slowly, articulating more clearly uh, to make it easier for the uh, target child to follow her instructions. I'd like to say that all moms I encourage to ac actively participate in school life uh, to develop activities for children and moms, uh, um, activities for children and moms that facilitate uh, the inclusion of their children. Uh, there are additional lessons, um, English lessons. Um, as I've said, I call it a Twife at Ukrainian Family School, which in turn also as this lesson help mom to understand and appreciate uh, the education in of uh, Great Britain, the moms of uh, displaced learners are at the heart of schools based initiatives to support the well being of the children too, and uh, parents, uh, I think that uh, they can help schools and. Uh, understand the experiences of their children before, uh, during, and after their displacement. They can communicate um, 
crucial information on the needs of their children and how they are adjusting and they can contribute to the culturally meaningful and linguistically accessible interventions. I'd like to say that inclusion is an approach and philosophy that sees all children getting more opportunities, both socially, emotionally, or not both, socially, emotionally, and educationally. Inclusion is an approach that considers uh, the diversity of children, their abilities, and their needs. An inclusive school is a school where every child becomes a very important and significant participant in the school community. And the ad adults, teachers, parents, administrators, the community interact as equal partners and all of them take care of each child in school. I would like to say um, uh, about uh, Southampton Community Group, um, um, you know, uh, that uh, Southampton for this time, or maybe you don't know for this time, Southampton has no a large population of Ukrainian refugees. And uh, Southampton Ukrainian Community Support Group and Tutor Dr. Central Southampton Salisbury organized free additional English lessons for Ukrainian children. Almost all the younger children were unable to take their place in school because they spoke very little or no English. Uh, so for the last seven months, Tutor Doctor has been given them free weekly English lessons at Wollstone Library. Uh, Tutor Doctor Central uh, Southampton Salisbury uh, works with private tut uh, tutoring professionals. Uh, their local uh, tutoring services include private tuition at home and online tut tutoring for children and adults and support the students inside and outside of school. Uh, because of the war, a tutor doctor works with a group of Ukrainian children who have confronted an especially difficult set of circumstances. I believe uh, that um, a multilingual environment outside of the school is an important for realizing the value and understanding of other languages and cultures as a formal education. Uh, this school is about uh, learning English, uh, the importance of home language and bilingual support. Uh, it promotes intercultural learning environments. Home language skills are transferable to a new languages and strengthen children's understanding of language use, develop friendships, facilitate language learning, and express and cope with emotions in a non-stressful way. Our children switch, switch between languages or mix two languages uh, when they are speaking, they enjoy their lessons. And uh, I'd like to say that children work incredibly hard. And um, we have uh, different parties together. Uh, we celebrated a lot of birthday parties. We celebrated Halloween. Uh, we had uh, the Christmas party with children and with their parents. And uh, Southampton Ukrainian uh, Community Support Group runs activities that enable children and their parents to keep in touch with their home, Ukrainian culture and language. And uh, this community helped to organize uh, Ukrainian language lessons for children. Um, 
mother tongue is a, is an important part of a child culture, identity, and beliefs. Uh, language is essential to express of culture, and uh, language is a fundamental aspect of cultural identity. And language is a code of the nation. Uh, my son uh, and I feel safe here. We're happy to be here. And we are also full of anxiety. We are so worried about our country and upset with everything that's going on. It is difficult to talk about it, but Ukrainian children became a target for the Russian invaders. As of uh, um, uh, for the information up to the December the 28th, at least uh, 450 children died and 868 were injured. This is according to official data. Uh, this figure doesn't include the children who died in Mariupol. But Ukraine will not forget any of these small victims, victims of a bloody war. Uh, once uh, Winston Churchill promised blood, sweat, and tears to his own people. And the Ukrainian nation has to come through uh, blood, sweat, and tears too. Thanks a lot to Great Britain, European countries, the USA, Canada, and other countries in the world for supporting Ukraine. Um, I want our children to be able to look up and see a clear sky above us. Um, we have all together to create conditions to protect the future generation in order to make the world uh, a better place. I am so proud to be Ukrainian. I am proud of the Ukrainian people, the people who live in my motherland. These people are the bravest people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luda. Um, I'm just going to talk now um, about an approach that's available nationally um, to meet the needs of children from all over the world that are seeking sanctuary. Um, my research around this area was involved interviewing teachers. Um, all of the teachers that I interviewed um, at that time had included children under the Syrian resettlement scheme. Um, but a lot of the issues that Luda has mentioned were the exact themes that came up in my own research. So um, the need to support children's language, um, to support their so social and emotional needs, um, and to offer that warm, inclusive welcome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a group that I've been involved with for quite a long time, Schools of Sanctuary. Um, and it's part of a wider picture. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please, Wayne. Thank you. So City of Sanctuary started in the early 2000s. Some of you may have come across this and be aware that Southampton is a City of Sanctuary and Winchester is a City of Sanctuary. Um, and it started in Sheffield. And within the City of Sanctuary um, programme, there are different streams. So we'll you have um, you can have libraries of sanctuary, um, midwives of sanctuary, but the schools of sanctuary stream is a very um, interesting framework that schools can look to to make sure that they're doing all the wonderful things that um, Luda's explained to us about at Twyford St Mary's. 
So there is a website link there to follow if you're interested to search on it. Would you go to the next one, please, Wayne? So um, you may or may not be aware, University of Winchester is a University of Sanctuary. So this is another stream within that. It's quite a rigorous assessment that you go through. It doesn't cost anything, but you just have to demonstrate to the group that <laughs> are looking at your um, evidence that you meet a lot of criteria around inclusive practice. So um, we became a University of Sanctuary a few years ago now, and we've just been re validated and I know some of our other colleagues in other universities have been looking to go through this or have been through this process as well. So for us it's a really important part of our culture within the university. So part of that is around making sure we give a warm welcome to sanctuary students who are offered places at the university um, but it's also around making sure that we understand what it means to be seeking sanctuary and that that's embedded within each of our faculties across the university um, in terms of our curriculum and what we're um, studying with our students. So for me, working in the Institute of Education, um, I will give uh, lectures and seminars to our trainee teachers that look at what it might mean to be a teacher of a child who's seeking sanctuary. So um, if we just go on and I'll tell you a little bit about the School of Sanctuary framework. So what is a School of Sanctuary? So um, a School of Sanctuary will have gone through a process of an assessment and you can go on the website here and have a look. There's a list of who your local schools of sanctuary are. There's a huge amount in um, Southampton. There, there was a group there that worked very, very hard to make sure that lots of schools and supported lots of schools through their assessment process. There is one in Hampshire. I've got a feeling it might have been because um, it was someone from Southampton had a bit of a link there. So we're hoping that more and more schools in the region will choose to become a school of sanctuary and I'm more than happy to talk to people about that if they would be interested um, but if I go to the next slide I'll explain what a school of sanctuary might look like so if I'm honest I my pretty much my entire teaching career has been around inclusive education um, and it struck me that actually to become a school of sanctuary you're looking at being an inclusive educational setting anyway so it's not it's not really an add-on it's going to be part of the school's ethos um, a school that is inclusive will foster this culture of welcome to everybody that crosses the threshold but for a school of sanctuary it's particularly around making sure that school feels like a safe place for children um, that are seeking sanctuary and their families as well but it also involves the school understanding what it might be to be seeking sanctuary. So you can become a school of sanctuary without having any children that are seeking sanctuary on your school role. You need to understand what it might be to um, be someone that's been forced to migrate. You will understand some of the different, er um, the sort of circumstances in which people might be forced to migrate. So it could be through war, but it can be through environmental causes as well. And we talk a lot about human rights. So um, some of our schools in the locality um, have the UNICEF Rights Respecting School Award as well. And that very much fits with the idea of being a school of sanctuary. So it's a very um, practical approach to making sure that it's absolutely a thread that runs through the curriculum, but also through the policies and the cultures and the practices. The other thing is that it's about building into cultural awareness and um, making sure that the voices of um, a whole range of people are heard um, so that people can have this better understanding. So obviously, um, you know, through people working in school like Luda, um, being able to talk with children about what it might be to be a forced migrant will enable people, going back to Luda's quote from um, Bauman, not to see people as strangers, but to see people as people and um, to be able to celebrate those similarities within that diversity, in that diverse community of the school. Go on to the next one, please, Wayne. So um, there's schools of sanctuary across the UK. Um, 
schools can be uh, have the materials adapted because obviously there's very different contexts. Um, schools can be situated in the middle of a very popular city, but they could be quite rural and it might be that they have children. Um, so we have around Winchester, the Rural Refugees Network. So some of our schools um, prior to um, last year, the 24th of February, were already welcoming children from Afghanistan, from Syria. But the, the sort of mantra really of Schools of Sanctuary is that we learn about um, what it might be to be seeking sanctuary. We embed it within our cultures, our policies, our practices, and we have a commitment to share that. So as a university of sanctuary, we're committed to share, as I'm doing now, those sorts of things that we do um, to support people seeking sanctuary and to support an understanding of what it might be to be seeking sanctuary. And it's the same for schools. So different schools do different things. Some will do things throughout the year. So Southampton Schools of Sanctuary have always had a project where they um, do welcome boxes and um, schools contribute lots of different things um, that might be given as a welcome pack to families that are newly arrived. Um, lots of events happen do, during Refugee Week in June. Um, there's all sorts of things. There's the culture of um, the Festival of Culture as well. I know a couple of schools in Southampton do. And it's all about sharing um, and celebrating that diversity within their school communities. Um, this is a quote actually taken from my own research. Um, and I was talking to a deputy who had led on the School of Sanctuary in her school. So I'm just going to go through her words, really, um, because I think this is particularly relevant. So what was comforting, though, when you kind of work through the process of becoming a School of Sanctuary? There are three things that you have to do. So I've just outlined those. And because of the natures of school and, you know, their inclusive nature anyway, lots of these things were already covered, which was good to know. But the specific refugee elements weren't. And that really opened my eyes to thinking. So schools are already being very inclusive and doing lots of lovely things and making sure that children feel welcome and that their families are included. But it was that teaching about what it means to be seeking sanctuary and really having an understanding of how that might have an impact on someone wasn't covered. So we don't do enough of this, she said. I don't think anybody does because it's not really part of our training. It's not, you know, part of the package for teachers. Now, this really resonated with me at the time um, when I was talking to her and I thought, right, OK, we need to do something about that and we need to change that. So it very much is part of the package of our initial teacher education at Winchester now um, as part of the bigger package around inclusive education. Um, but I think there's still more that we could be doing. So just um, as we draw to a close, Wayne and I have worked for a few years now looking at this with colleagues across Europe, um, which has been an absolute privilege. Um, and I, I've used this quote here that's taken from a piece of work that we did, um, because we felt really when when you step into that inclusive school, like Lude has described, and there's a child that's been uprooted from their home, you want them to encounter this attitude of trust. Um, they've been through things that we don't know, we can't comprehend and we shouldn't maybe, we don't need to know necessarily, we just need to know that there needs to be this welcoming, safe and trusting environment where they can feel that they can just breathe that sigh of relief and be welcomed. And so um, we need to know that through school cultures that there's an attitude of acceptance that there's not hostility. So going back to learning that intercultural awareness and making sure that that's embedded in curriculum is really, really important. And I'm just sort of looping back to what Wayne said about the person that someone is becoming. You know, we're, we're greeting these children as they come through our doors as an individual with their own stories. Um, we're not we're trying to work and I definitely try to work with the trainee teachers to overcome those generalizations and stereotypes um, to acknowledge that person that they might become and to acknowledge the fact that um, like Luda said you know looking up at that beautiful blue sky one day um, 
and hoping that you know maybe people can return home but in the meantime making sure that we are creating these safe spaces within our educational environments be that a school of sanctuary or a university of sanctuary so i'm going to end there um, to give an opportunity for any questions at all Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you all three for a, for a great session. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you could please pop them in the chat uh, and I'm just going to, um, to read it out. Great. I can't I can't see any um, questions coming through for now. Um, if anyone does have a question, then I send out the um, Eventbrite email with the recording link once it is ready. Um, I will uh, include our speakers speakers email addresses. Um, and if if you can th uh, if you think of any questions later on, they will be more than happy to answer. Or oh, we actually do have one. Um, is how long does it take to become a school of sanctuary? Shall I answer that one? Um, it varies. Um, usually when a school expresses an interest, we'll talk with them about the sorts of things that are expect they're um, expected to present in terms of evidence. But it's usually just a couple of terms, really. Um, there's uh, everybody looks at the evidence once they submit it. There has to be someone with lived experience as part of that lived experience of being someone seeking sanctuary as part of that team. Um, and then there'll be a school visit. It's not inspectorial, it's very supportive. It's not like having an Ofsted inspection or anything like that. And clearly we want schools to become schools of sanctuary. So we don't try to make it hard, but it is rigorous. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have, do you have any advice for UniConnects wanting to start working with student refugees and finding out where they are within the city? Well, one of the things that we're doing at Winchester is uh, creating a hub where um, teachers can um, work together to uh, share their experiences, share their expertise and share resources. And um, at Winchester, we've connected with other universities, but also with Cities of Sanctuary and um, charity organisations and organisations working in the area of trauma. So um, it would be wonderful. At the moment, we're doing a lot of work with colleges uh, of further education and a lot of work with primary schools, but we're not doing so much work with secondary uh, um, schools. So it, it would be given that we've got a rather large number of people interested in this uh, event, it would be really interesting to have your email to invite you to a, 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 a events that we're organizing through Winchester, but also to um, connect you to um, these uh, other teachers, but also um, other experts in this area uh, and people who are working on the ground. So um, I, I think a, a sort of the first answer would be, you know, please get, get in touch and, um, and um, you, you know, join, join this network of uh, teachers who are supporting each other in, in, in uh, Hampshire. Um, great, thank you. Um, a question from Mark. Once a school is recognised as a school of sanctuary, what responsibilities does it have? So it has a responsibility to learn, embed and share and to keep demonstrating that it's doing that. And once you're within that network, you work with other schools to think of different ways that you might do that and share ideas and activities. Um, so and they have a responsibility to remain an inclusive and welcoming setting but other than that it's re it's revalidated every three years I think it is now um, obviously because of Covid we're a little bit behind with reassessing um, some of the schools locally but there, there's a program that's in place now I've been talking to the lead in Southampton um, so those are those re responsibilities to learn embed and share um, so it's not 
to demanding and it can be done quite easily through the curriculum. I know of one school where they take a lot of stories um, about what it might mean to be seeking sanctuary and they consider that through their English curriculum. Um, different schools do different things. So um, shall I just answer the question above as well from iPad 4 about secondary school? And actually, just before I do that, I feel really bad because there are there are colleges of sanctuary as well locally. And I didn't mention them. I talked about schools of sanctuary. I talked about universities, but there are also colleges of sanctuary. And there are some schools, colleges that are thinking of going for the um, accreditation as well. Um, in terms of the secondary schools, different schools do take different approaches to make sure that children feel included because they are big places. Um, there's quite often a hub where people can go. Um, I don't know if anyone watched a few years ago, Educating Manchester. There was, I think it was the second episode, was beautiful, where they welcomed a child um, who was seeking sanctuary. And there was this very... Um, welcoming hub which was a smaller place where he could go and be until he felt ready to go and be within mainstream lessons or just someone who's they can touch base with um, there is research to show that children find it very comforting if they're able to talk to someone in their um, home language as well so if that is available that can help children to feel much more included um, as well um, and I think there's a question from Jan as well about the slides, mm -hmm. but I guess Agnes, you'll answer that. Yes, if um, well, I was going to ask if if you are happy to share, if, happy for me yes. to attach the PowerPoint um, to the event by email, then yes, by all means. So, uh, sorry but for those of you who can't see it, Jan just saying that um, there are some very useful slides um, in the presentation, so it would be great um, to have those as well as the recording. So once um, once that is ready, I will. Um, um, I will attach that as well um, to the email. I've popped I have a, my email. Sorry, Luda. No, no, no. no. Go on, it's you okay. go. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm working as a primary school ch children. And um, as I've said, I've uh, met a lot of Ukrainians um, in the different communities. And um, uh, the parents who have... A the primary school children and uh, the parents who have... Um, uh, college students, they are more happy than the parents who have uh, the secondary school children. I am, uh, I'd like to say that I have, uh, I have a son, but I have a teenager. I, he studies one in the best school in Hampshire. They do a lot for the Ukrainian children, but he is not adaptive. He misses his family, his school, Ukraine, um, a lot of. And uh, the most parents of, uh, um, the parents of teenagers say the same. And um, I try to find for him uh, uh, hobbies and different activities, but uh, he's very upset. Sometimes he's very upset. And a little bit easier with primary school children. Uh, you understand that um, some children uh, left Ukraine in the beginning of the war. Some uh, children, uh, they saw the, the more, more things that the children don't need to see. And um, uh, most of the children, they need uh, psychological help. They need the help of psychologists. I'd like to say that um, the, uh, I like the meetings with uh, with with uh, uh, with people from Winchester City of Sanctuary, and uh, there are some uh, Ukrainian psychologists and um, Leslie and uh, another people from um, Winchester City of Sanctuary. They help psychologists to start working with the Ukrainian children, but they can't work because they don't have the permission to work uh, here in the UK. But a lot of these psychologists, they don't know uh, English properly and um, they can't study for this time, only for this time. But the Ukrainian 
children, they need the psychological support, like my, my, my teenager. So um, it is a question how to help uh, in school, out school, and how to help with uh, a psychologist together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luda. Um, if we don't have um, any more questions, we've just got to... Um, Four questions they are really quick so um if you i'm just going just about to launch those if you could answer them um that would be great just for us to have um some feedback i just launched it so hopefully you're all able to see it Thank you for a great session, all three of you, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as I said, we will uh, you will get an, uh, an email from me, Rand Bright, with the recording, um, the PowerPoint, and also um, just the speakers' email addresses as well. Um, if you've got any more any more questions. Great, and thank you all for answering um, the poll results as well. And have a have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.